Welcome to the Cedar Creek Bible in a Year podcast. Whether you are listening on your own, with a friend, or a group of friends, we hope this podcast helps you connect with Scripture and also enriches your relationship with God. Here are your hosts, Luke Shortridge and Andy Rechtenwald. Hi guys, Cedar Creek Radio is back on the air. Luke Shortridge hanging out with the Andy Rechtenwald. Andy, how are you doing today? Great, Luke. How are you doing? I'm doing wonderful. Well, today we're going to be talking about some of Jesus' miracles as well as his teaching style, both of which were a little mysterious. They left people baffled. Yeah. So here's what I have planned for us today to start things off. I am going to read to you a list of miracles. These are reported miracles that people have said have happened. Yep. Uh, Some of these, the verification process is just fascinating. (laughs) Um, Other miracles that I'm going to read, I completely made up. Okay. So you have to tell me if this was indeed oh, a man. reported miracle or if Luke Shortridge made it up. So, for example, I would say the Virgin Mary is reported to have appeared dozens of times, praying for people, encouraging them, prophesying to them. Uh, there's even a name for these appearances called Marian apparitions. And then I would say, is this something that's happened or did you make it up? And you would say... That's something that people claim to have happened. Totally true. Hundreds yeah. of examples if you look online, which I did. So, all right, I pulled from a few different sources here, but you just you just got to take my word for it on, on some of these. All right, here we go. Incorruptible corpses. So here a dude died, but his corpse didn't rot, and he stayed that way for hundreds of years. True. Totally true. There are so many examples of this. Uh, there are hundreds of examples of corpses which reportedly do not decay, Uh, Some of these are on display today. You can't touch them or get close to them, but supposedly... They're like fully no decomp at all? Correct. So basically here, the corpse can't look any different than it's sleeping, can't smell bad, it can't show any signs of aging whatsoever, and also the body supposedly cannot be preserved in any way. So there can't be any embalming. Right. Thing like that happens and it doesn't count as an incorruptible There's a bunch of these like that have actually happened? Look it up. Look it up. What? Now, I, I, will, I will tell you here, um, this is a big deal in the Catholic Church. I'm not trying to single them out, but the church will either say, yes, this person has an incorruptible corpse or not, and it is one of the ways that they look for sainthood, that if someone's corpse doesn't decay, then the Catholic Church will say, yeah, that person probably was a saint. And it's happened wow. supposedly hundreds of times. I'm looking up right now. It says like it's just a scientific mystery. They have no I, idea how it happens. I was not raised Catholic, so I didn't really know about this until I started looking into it. But it is fascinating. In fact, there are some that supposedly died in the 2nd and 3rd century. What? Yeah. All right. Here we go. Here's the next one. We're moving on. A virgin birth. So reportedly, a girl became pregnant after having visions. Medical examinations confirmed she was still a virgin. False. Eric? I mean, I don't care what the answer is. It's, it has to be false because there is no medical examination. Yeah, I made it up. Virginity. I, dang, you guys <laughs> sniffed that out so quickly. I really thought I was going to get you on that. All right. Next up, a case of stigmata. A woman supposedly bled almost nonstop for 40 years from her eyes, hands, and more. I saw the movie Stigmata. That thing was that movie's crazy. I'm gonna say I'm gonna say it's an actual claim. True. Oh yeah, totally, totally claimed in 1918 in Germany. Gosh. There was a woman, Therese Newman. She was partially paralyzed after falling off of a stool. She was helping her uncle milk cows. I'm not making this up. Falls off a stool, becomes partially paralyzed. After that, she falls several more times, becomes temporarily blind. She's in the hospital. In 1926, she begins bleeding first in a wound slightly over her heart. Then she starts bleeding from her eyes, from her hands. My gosh. She starts having visions, and supposedly she continues to bleed on and off for 40 years. And it, I guess, like on a Good Friday, right before Easter, that was when the bleeding was the most intense. I saw some pictures. It's gruesome. Wow. Uh, and she lived into the early 60s and supposedly that just continued that's nuts her whole life that's crazy i know yeah and and again 
I, I want to make clear here, I'm not saying that I believe this or I don't. I'm just telling you what I found. Right. I have not researched these in depth to That's make That's why I keep saying, has it been claimed? These yeah, are right. claims. Claim right versus something Luke just made up out of nowhere. That's right. Yep. Okay, next. Miraculous levitation. A dude floated above a parade. Well, Chris Angel has done it several times, so <laughs> true. <laughs> yep, this is an actual claim. In 1630... Joseph of It's Cupertino. happened in 2015. Chris Angel does it all the time. I don't know what we're getting at here. <laughs> David Blaine. Was this confirmed? Yeah, I've the... seen it. It's on video. Oh, <laughs> I, I don't even know what to do with you. <laughs> okay. Next, a resurrected bovine. A cow died, came back to life several days later. Father, son, and holy cow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say false. Yeah, I made that up. Because you used the word Gosh. bovine. You got me there with the word bovine. Oh, come on. That doesn't sound scholarly. That's why, that's why I guessed it, because it was too scholarly. All right, here's the next one. Transubstantiation. Communion elements became actual flesh and blood. True. Yeah, I'm sure there's been several claims about that. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. 780, an Italian monk and priest was assigned to celebrate the Eucharist. He had previously only used leavened bread and was assigned to use unleavened bread. He doubted that the unleavened bread would become transubstantiate into Christ's flesh and blood. Uh, and supposedly he blesses the elements, consecrates them. They become living flesh and blood, which they still have on display. Supposedly in the 70s, these were tested and came back as actual flesh and blood. Wow. That's crazy. There you go. All right, next, walking on the water. A man claimed that he had walked on water dozens of times and even did so in front of a crowd of more than 1,000 people. Pretty sure Chris Angel did that too. Uh, <laughs> say true. <laughs> it's false. I made it Dang up. It. <laughs> <laughs> totally made it up. All right. Maybe Chris Angel didn't do that one. Maybe not. All right, here's our last one. Miracle of the sun. The sun became a spinning disc and zigzagged through the sky. What? I don't know. Uh, there's reports of, I don't know, false. So this is true. This, this is crazy. What in the world? 1917 in Portugal, witnessed by, okay, you ready? I, I cannot explain this. Over 30,000 people. What? In 1917. The sun became a spinning disc and zigzagged everywhere? Right, here, here's the story. Three shepherd I mean, children claimed a miracle was going to happen on high noon on October 13th. Why that day, I don't know. After a downfall of, downfall of rain, dark clouds broke and the sun appeared as an opaque spinning disk in the sky. It was significantly less bright than normal and cast multicolored lights across the sky. It then careened toward the earth in a zigzag pattern, frightening some who thought it was the end of the world. Some said that their previously wet clothing became dry. That, that's crazy. I, I'm not making fun of these claims. No. I, I don't understand how 30,000 people can all see something that they don't understand. Right. Um, but 30,000 people. Yeah. There you go. That's There's nuts. your reported miracles. That's awesome. Day. All right. Well, Andy, let's get into the gospel account. We're going to be talking about miracles today and the parables of Jesus. First, though, I'd like to highlight the book of Luke, my namesake. What do we know about Luke? Well, he was the other, so we, we said last time, Mark was not an original disciple of Jesus. Um, same thing with Luke. Uh, he was actually commissioned, you learned this in Luke, the first chapter of Luke, by a man named Theophilus, who um, historians would say is probably a rich man that was interested in all the talk about Jesus. Um, and Luke was actually, because we hear this from Paul, a physician, and by the way he writes, probably an historian, um, he's the most detailed gospel writer for yep. sure. I yep. mean, you see things like when he explains in Acts some of the ships and describes them in right. perfect detail. Painstaking detail. Yeah. Yes. So he was a historian and a physician. So very smart guy. Well, and you made the point too that he was a traveling companion of Paul. Yep. So he writes his gospel probably under the authority of Paul. Probably Paul helped to guide that. Um, also, I think it's interesting that he wrote primarily to a non-Jewish audience. Yep. He was writing to everybody. Uh, Luke has the most. Uh, most accounts of Jesus interacting with women. Luke highlights the story of women more than any other gospel. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it is fascinating. You, you really see a human side of Jesus in Luke's gospel. Yeah. He's really tied into 
how Jesus loved people and interacted with them, uh, people from all different walks of life. Which you would make sense given the fact that he's he's writing this with a Gentile audience in mind who Jews would not have associated with typically. Well, and, and even a physician. I mean, if, if you're a physician who truly cares about people, yeah. you, know, you talk about bedside manner, you care about the science, but you also care about the individual. And I'd say Luke probably was a probably was a good combination of both yeah he also as this again makes sense given his detail his um uh the amount of details he has the longest gospel account out of the four and has the most parables he's got i think one chart showed 25 parables and they always differ because some of them combine some from different gospels yep he had 18 of the 25 in his gospel which is incredible yeah pretty fascinating Cool. So every week we got to give you guys an opportunity to dive into God's Word with us. If you have a Bible handy, now is a good time to pull that out. Or you can switch over to a Bible app if you are listening to us on your phone. We're going to be in the New Living Translation. If you are listening with a group of friends, we're going to be asking some questions. Feel free to discuss those questions. If you're listening by yourself, you may want to journal. Um, or if you want to just even stop the podcast and think about what your answer would be to the questions, we'll do our best to answer the questions as we're going along mm-hmm. as well. All right. So uh, we are going to begin in Luke chapter 5. We're going to read 17 through 26, one of the miracles of Jesus. Andy, you want to take it away for us? Yep. One day while Jesus was teaching, some Pharisees and teachers of religious law were sitting nearby. It seemed that these men showed up from every village in all Galilee and Judea, as well as from Jerusalem, and the Lord's healing power was strongly with Jesus. Some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a sleeping mat. They tried to take him inside to Jesus, but they couldn't reach him because of the crowd. So they went up to the roof and took off some tiles. Then they lowered the sick man on his mat down into the crowd right in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the man, Young man, your sins are forgiven. But the Pharisees and teachers of the religious law said to themselves, Who does he think he is? That's blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew what they were thinking, so he asked them, Why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or stand up and walk? So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, Stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And immediately, as everyone watched, the man jumped up, picked up his mat, and went home praising God. Everyone was gripped with great wonder and awe, and they praised God, exclaiming, We have seen amazing things today. All right, so I I think this is super cool. Jesus has the opportunity to tell the man, Your sins are forgiven, and perhaps that would be it. Right. But he he really backs up his words with actions, and he challenges the Pharisees because he had enemies, people that were trying to disprove him. He, He challenges them by showing who he really was, that he has power and authority, unlike power and authority that they have. Uh, And he's not just a matter of talk, but he's a matter of actions as well. So he gives the man probably what he wants, the ability to walk, but he really gives him what he needs as well, the forgiveness of sins, to make him spiritually right as well as physically right. He completely restores the man, and he does this on display for all to see. Yeah, I mean, it is really interesting. I've heard a lot of theories about how this happened because they're they're carrying this dude on a sleeping mat, obviously <laughs> knowing that Jesus was a healer at this point. Yep. They take him on the roof, right? And then they have to lower him through the the ceiling, which is like crazy. Yep. Um, and I did a little research on it. Obviously, uh, um, back then they had, the roofs were made of thatch and like, so it's easy. It wasn't just like our roofs today where they had to get like a construction crew out there and say, hey, dig a hole in here so we can get right, in. Right, right. But you think about like how they got him down there. Like, would they have like a pulley system or they just drop him, just like drop him right in front of Jesus. And like, imagine the, the crowd going, like, what is going on? What are they right, dropping? He's right. paralyzed. And I, the whole story is so amazing and so crazy yeah. to me. Well, I, I think it's also interesting that. The faith here really is of the friends. Yeah. You know, and somehow, like, their faith is transferred to the man. I mean, of course, I, I guess the man could have, like, kicked and screamed and said, no, don't, right, don't right, right. lower me in. But really, Jesus sees their faith, their faithfulness yeah. and their ingenuity. Uh, and because of that, he praises them by giving them what they're asking for, and that yeah. is for their uh, friend to be healed. Do, do you think that at all is like an allusion to um, the love thy neighbor type of thing? You know, the the idea that the the best, the most important commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, you know, blah, 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 mm-hmm. and then to love your neighbor as yourself. And so because these two were engaging in what was the most important thing on earth that you could do hmm. by loving their friend, engaging their friend, you know, what 
what would you do if right. your friend was paralyzed and you knew there was a healer in right. town? You would, if you were really loving him, you would do whatever you could to get him in front of that healer. Yeah, that's a good point, Eric. And I do think it's fascinating. The text says seeing their faith. So it, it doesn't say seeing their good deeds, uh, but it also doesn't say seeing the man's faith. It's seeing their faith so, or their faithfulness. Um, that Jesus says to the man, young man, your sins are forgiven. Um, it, it, it's interesting. You know, you, you don't know why Jesus does the things that he does, but it's sure fun to think about it and to hypothesize about it. I guess we won't know until we get to heaven and we ask him. Right. Um, but I, I think that Jesus, I think he's probably a little taken back by their audacity, their boldness, their ingenuity. And because of that, He's like, all right, something special is going to happen here. Right. Um, I, I do think it's interesting. When you look at the miracles in the New Testament, oftentimes they're not called miracles. They're called signs. Signs, yeah. They point to something. When you think about a stop sign, a stop sign tells you something. You know, it says right. stop, yep. and it hopefully stops you from getting into a car accident. Jesus' miracles here point to something. Yeah. They're telling you something. They are saying, stop. Do you see what's happening here? And in this case, I believe they're pointing to his divinity yeah, oh because yeah. someone who is fully man and that's it can't do the miraculous things Jesus did. Right. There's no explanation for that. It's almost like, too, if you if you look at the way this whole thing goes down, it's it's also a judgment to the Pharisees, too, because he they're thinking to themselves the things that he brings out into the light. And then to show them that he has the authority, he proves it by by healing this man. Um, and you see that a lot with the way that he interacts with Pharisees is he does things to to somewhat have a cast a judgment onto the Pharisees and say, okay, so you, you're questioning me, and whether or not I can forgive sins, call me a blasphemer, now what are you going to do about it? Because right. I just healed the man that you that has been paralyzed. Well, and you got to keep in mind, too, the Pharisees saw someone who was lame as someone who was sinful. They, yeah. they equated it. Yep. Um, they believed that physical ailments happened because of people's either lack of faith or sinfulness. It was just assumed we see this in John chapter 9 mm -hmm. when Jesus uh, heals the man who was born blind. You know, e even the disciples were thinking this way. They asked Jesus, What do you uh, think he Jesus, did? Jesus, did this man sin or his parents mm -hmm. sin? It wasn't, uh, was sin connected to this? It was just assumed. It was taken yeah. for granted. So the Pharisees saw this man as sinful because he could not walk. And Jesus says, Well, your sins are forgiven. I, I can't even imagine how they had to have bristled at that. Right. Like, who does this guy think he is right. that he can just forgive sins? You, you got to remember, they are in a sacrificial system that there is no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood. Blood yeah. has to be spilt, probably from a sacrificial animal, so that this man's sins can be forgiven. Jesus just says, just says it, and it's so. Right. They bristle at this, but then Jesus backs it up with his actions. So, okay, here's our question. Is it easy to read this passage quickly without seeing how truly amazing it is? Um, I'd say yes. Why is it difficult to be as amazed as the people in the passage were? I think today it's it's like the first part. It's easy to read through the passage quickly without, I mean, you can just read and say, oh, great, it's a miracle, whatever. But think about, I thought about this um, the other day, like the dude hadn't walked, he's paralyzed. Mm -hmm. If today you knew one of your, like one of your friends who was never able to walk, he's paralyzed, and all it took was a man saying, get up and walk. Right. And he just gets up and walk. Well, the authority Jesus showed there was What kind of incredible. condition do you think this man's legs were in? I mean, he's, he's on a mat. I mean, if, if he hadn't walked in years, there's no muscle there. There's no, you know, it's just, they're they're just bone and skin pretty much, you right. know? Yep. So he, he heals him and he can get up and walk. I mean, the healing was ri ridiculously incredible there. Have you ever heard people try to scientifically disprove miracles? Yeah, it's hilarious. <laughs> it's hilarious. Of course they're not. Yeah, It's a miracle. Right, that's it's the point. It's not supposed to make sense. Right, that's the point. Yeah, but but imagine seeing someone whose legs really should not be able to support their weight. Right. Someone who's never walked, stand up, and have strength return. Crazy. Uh, imagine what you would be thinking. Oh, man. Yeah, I, I think, as you said, Andy, it's very easy to just glaze over passages like this and think, okay, that was... 2,000 years ago, whatever, but man, put yourself in the story and think about the awe and wonder you would be feeling. It, it's almost amazing to me at, at times thinking about the Pharisees that they just became angry. <laughs> yeah. They just saw this and thought, oh boy, this is this is a direct threat to us. Right. We got to take this guy out. It's crazy. Scary. All right. Well, let's move on to Luke 7, 11 through 17. Uh, this is the story of Jesus raising a widow's son. Soon afterward, Jesus went with his disciples to the village of Nain. 
a large crowd followed him. A funeral procession was coming as he approached the village gate. A young man who had died was a widow's only son, and a large crowd from the village was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart overflowed with compassion. Don't cry, he said, and then he walked over to the coffin and touched it, and the bearers stopped. Young man, he said, I tell you, get up. Then the dead boy sat up, began to talk. Jesus gave him back to his mother. Great fear swept through the crowd, and they praised God, saying, A mighty prophet has risen among us, and God has visited his people today. And the news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding countryside. There you go. Raise the dead guy. I mean. you imagine seeing, like, a funeral procession of cars, and somebody just stops them and says, Wait, oh, hold on here. Let me let me see the hearse. Okay, <sighs> casket. Come on out. Oh, okay, you're alive nope. now. He's alive. Wait, wait. What a waste. We had this whole funeral procession going. He's not actually dead. No, he was. I just made him back alive. What? This you is still crazy. get to have lunch at the wake? Right. Probably. Uh, probably well, I mean, yeah, you probably you already ordered the food. Yeah. At this point, you're not, it's just a big celebration now. He was dead. Now he's not. Not paying I heard what you guys said banquet, about no. being your eulogies. <laughs> <laughs> <Jerks>. <laughs> oh, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. So, you know, I, I always thought about when Jesus raises people back to life, and he does this several times, I always thought, does that make the resurrection less special because right, he already no, no. did it? Uh, the answer would be no. No. Because when Jesus was resurrected, he did not die again. Right. Um, this young man, it, I mean, as amazing as this was, and it, it was amazing, he did die at some point. Sure. Um, you know, was it Peter's mother-in-law that Jesus resurrected? Uh, she was very sick. Yeah, it was his mother-in-law. Yeah. There's a young girl. And Lazarus. And Lazarus, yeah. all of these people died. Yeah. So it, eventually. It it was Jesus showing his power, um, his divinity, his mastery over um, really the laws of science and physics and nature. Right. Um, he was the one causing this and directing it. Yeah. It wasn't happening to him, it was happening through him. Yeah, I think it was N.T. Wright that pointed out that in one of his big books on the resurrection, he said that there's a huge difference between revivification or just bringing back to life and the resurrection, which is a completely new life. It's, That's right. It's a That's new, right. it's a glorified body, all that kind of stuff. And so I've thought that before too, like couple, when, I, when I've been reading like, okay, but why is Lazarus not, you know, like he raised from the dead too. God raised Lazarus from the dead, but it is different. It's just he was brought back to life to where he will eventually die. I mean, the Pharisees wanted to kill Lazarus um, later on. And he could have died eventually. We don't know what happened to him, but yep. uh, it is, it's totally different. All right, Andy, I got a question for you. Yeah. Maybe we could address this in a future podcast. I, I don't know what you're going to say here, so I'm just going to ask it. Great. Why do you think we don't see these kind of dramatic miracles today? Maybe you disagree. Maybe you think that we do. Yeah. Um, well, I'm, I'm curious. I would say there, there are two camps on this, okay. um, probably more than that, but the ones that I've heard from are that they do happen. We just don't see it in the West because we're not a people of as strong faith as the, the apostles were, the disciples were. I've heard that as well. Then there are another set of people, um, typically of the Reformed side, but not all the time, that think that the those gifts ceased after the last apostles died, that the gifts were ah, given to the apostles. Okay, okay. It's called cessationism, and their gifts stopped after the last apostle was killed off the earth, that they were needed to start the church Paul, to get things going. Paul then would be a full credit apostle. Yep, because, because he, he saw the risen Lord. People. Yep, and uh, in fact, Paul sent handkerchiefs to people. Yeah, that I mean, people. <laughs> right. And so, the the first camp. The problem I have with it is, I think there are plenty of people in the Western world that have authentic faith that trust God. I've seen these miracle healers, and they have videos, and sure. they're all fake. I mean, the ones that I've seen, they do a foot trick where they grow the foot. And I've watched yeah. how they fake it. I'm not doubting that miracles could happen because God can do whatever he wants. I don't know, in my personal opinion, and you can disagree, is I don't know if God today um, does healing through people the same way he did before. I think when you see things like the medical clinic at the South Toledo campus, those aren't supernatural miracles. Where create, But to the people that are being healed there, that would be a miracle to them in, the, in okay. a personal way. So I would say I probably lay on the side of, especially with the gifts of um, raising from the dead and right. that kind of stuff, that I would probably lay on the more cessationist side. I mean, but can, can we all agree, like, the Red Sea hasn't been parted lately? Right. Noah's Ark hasn't happened? Like, exactly. There's a certain extent of miracles that happen in Scripture that we don't see in the same way today. Right. I mean, most of the time when I hear about miracles, it's either like a vision or someone has appeared 
or sure. it's a medical healing. And, yeah. and usually it seems to be a medical healing, which Jesus certainly did, so I'm not trying to discredit that. Right. Um, and to the people that are there, that's huge. I mean, you go from having right. cancer that's that you should be dead in a couple and, and months, I've heard and you're those totally stories. healed. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and I really can't explain them. Eric, what do you think? Where do you fall on this one? Um, I mean, it's a little closer to home, I think. I think probably Jackson is the same way for you, but yeah. you know, literally our um, neurologist every time he sees our son he had a category four brain hemorrhage and so when he looks at whatever the most current scan uh or you know mri or whatever it is he's, and he, he says that we always have to check to make sure that this is the right kid because wow. based on the amount of brain tissue we see <laughs> lost here he should not be walking he wow. should not be talking he should not be whatever like and i'm not sitting here claiming it's a oh miracle 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 because like i i I honestly, I don't proclaim to be smart enough to know. I think what Andy's talking about a little bit with, uh, maybe I'm putting words in your mouth, but like situational miracles or, or um, you know, that it just, because that's a miracle to us, you know? And sure. I think the, the people who get healed at the South Pseudo Medical Clinic that have no money, but because God has mm -hmm. organized a group sure. to be able to do that for free. I think the people who, um, you know, some of the claims of like, I wasn't gonna be able to pay my bills. And then all of a sudden somebody randomly gave me this. Sure. I think, you know, some people would call that coincidence, but I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, th I think there's, I feel a, like there's something. I've heard too many coincidences sure. to say, oh, random chance and circumstance. Right. Yeah. Um, man, good stuff, Eric. Thanks I for sharing. I think even after, I, I would say even after the fact is that, is that uh, Jesus said a couple of times, like, if, if you won't believe when I'm here, if you don't believe what I'm saying, if you didn't believe the prophets, then what would you believe if I rose somebody well, from the dead? What would you believe if I right. ca caused and he, a miracle? He also told the disciples, you believe because you've seen. Blessed are those who believe right. and do not see. Yep, told Thomas that. So you, do you want my official position on miracles? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Truthfully, I don't. Um, Perfect. I, on one side, I've heard many coincidences that just seem too much of a coincidence sure. to be random chance. On the other side, I see 400 years in between the Old Testament and the New Testament where God is apparently silent. Yeah. There are no recorded miracles. There are no recorded prophets. Right. So for let's say, I don't know, let, let, let's say for a span of 100 years, for there not to be one recorded miracle or yeah. one recorded prophet, that's not uncommon in the Bible. Right. So I don't know. I that's think my that's, official position. Yeah, I think that's <laughs> the interesting distinction that I was making is that it's not that God isn't doing miracles now because I think it would be very presumptuous of me to say that God isn't healing like Calvin or Jackson, yep. but rather that God isn't using Christians to go out and heal people with their hands or their handkerchiefs anymore because right. you don't have any evidence of that. But I wouldn't say that that's my official position. That's just what I think. Yeah, I got you. To a sense, you know. All right. Well, we could probably talk about miracles for an entire show. Yeah. Maybe we will in the future. I don't know. Uh, but I do want to jump to parables yeah. because Jesus baffled people the same way they saw, they saw miracles. They saw signs. They couldn't explain it. Jesus talked in parables. I, I think it's so fascinating. He told stories, but he didn't always reveal all of the the parable to right. them. He left people baffled, yep. and he was okay with that. He didn't <laughs> fill it in every single time. Sometimes he would explain it to the disciples. Sometimes he doesn't at all. I mean, right. we, we have parables of Jesus. He just didn't explain, or at least the, the gospel authors right. didn't explain, and we kind of kind of figure out what the you know what he meant by that. Yeah. So let, let's read an example here. Uh, we are going to be in, where are we at here, Andy? Luke 18, 9 through 14. Yeah, there we go. All right. Then Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, and the other was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. This prayer, I thank you, God, that I am not a sinner like everyone else. For I don't cheat, I don't sin, I don't commit adultery. I'm certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give you a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He dared to even lift his eyes to heaven and as he, as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, O oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So, Andy, what is this parable about? This is a story, so this didn't really happen, I don't think. Right. But it's a story, hypothetically, Jesus tells. What's going on here? Well, I love that. 
he uses the tax collector because again, I mean, you see when he when when they tell the stories in the Gospels, they say you have the sinners and then you have the tax collectors. Yeah, very black and white. They're worse than the, you know they're worse than the quote sinners. And yep. so yep. he has the Pharisee, the supposedly very righteous person, go in to pray. And I think it is very interesting to point out that he does start with thanking God. So he's got the okay. Christianese down. You know, he's got the nice <laughs> Christian language, even though, you know, Christian wasn't a term back then. But he do, he says what he's supposed to say. I thank you, God. He gives God, quote, Props. the credit for yep. his good action. Yep. Then you have the tax collector who won't even look up because he's so, the same way Peter, when Peter, when Jesus performed the fish miracle, he wouldn't look up at Jesus because he was so scared of him. Um and he says, be merciful to me because I'm a sinner. So you have one that says, I don't sin. It's because of you, but I don't sin. Like, I'm a good person now, or I am because I'm righteous. And then you have the other that's saying, I can't even look at you because I know how bad I am. Have you ever heard the traditional Pharisee prayer? No. That they prayed Probably not. commonly? God, I thank you that I'm not a sinner, a Gentile, or a woman. Woman, yes. Okay, I have heard that one. <laughs> yeah. I mean, think about the audacity to pray that. Right. And his prayer is so self-serving. Oh, yeah. I mean, thank you, God, that I'm perfect. That's right. basically I'm not what a sinner saying. like everybody else. I don't cheat. Right. I don't sin. The tax what, collector. what I think is fascinating about this is Jesus uses, in their time, modern-day relevant examples. He takes the culture yep. that the people understood they yep. could interact with. And what he's really teaching about is humility, yep. and he could have he picked anything. Yep. I mean, but instead he picked contemporary figures um, I think it might be the equivalent today of saying, like, you know, the president and a guy from Alcoholics Anonymous walk into a room and they have a conversation. I mean, he's he's using right people that as soon as he said their names, their titles, people instantly had thought a preconceived yep. thought about them. Yes. Yeah. Um, and do you see the even physically the way that the tax collector was praying to God was it everything about his prayer was he was humble he's a broken man and not like the hum- humility you hear a lot of times they was I'm just just a sinner like you no big <laughs> deal like oh, we are all sinners no it's like I know what I've done I know what yeah. inside I'm capable of I can't even look up at you right now because I'm so embarrassed and ashamed of what I've done and I think um, the, the question is that we want to ask is why is it so important to understand your sin in light of God's holiness and I want I'd like to start I think for me, the interesting thing is um, that, and I don't mean to bash, I did this a lot, but I don't mean to bash westernized Christianity because there's a huge difference between what you see here and what we see over in the East, um, in the Middle East and, and China, sure. places yeah. where you know Christianity is rising up. Here in the West, we tend to highlight a lot of Jesus' love for people and a lot of Jesus is like, he almost becomes this you see his picture he's this white dude with feathery brown hair (laughs) super nice just coming to hang out with the kids and play with everybody and we don't look at this parable here where he's he's saying like the tax collector did it right and he's afraid and he understands god does hate sin right but he he still loves you yes but we tend to elevate this one side of jesus who's fully god and fully man and leave out the other part you know truth and grace that whole thing yeah that's that's a great point andy yeah, I think, you know, thinking about our sin in light of God's holiness, we have a tendency, uh, we, I, I, I'd say probably everyone within the church, yeah. to downplay our own sinfulness and to also downplay God's holiness. Yeah. Um, I, I've heard the question, and I've been asked the question many times, you know, why would God allow suffering to good people? Why, mm-hmm. would, why would bad things happen to good people? Uh, I think it's because we don't realize that there really is no good people. Right. We are all sinful. We yep. all should be broken, as the tax collector here was. And also, we don't realize what it means for God to be holy. It means that there is no sin among him. He can't stand sin. He mm-hmm. hates sin. Sin is what caused him to have to give up his son. If there right. was no sin, if there was no rebellion, he never would have had to let Jesus go yeah. out of heaven. Um, that perfect unity that we can only read about and, and think about between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, that was disrupted for the first time because of sin. Yeah. So you see the sin that the Pharisee had that he wasn't willing to claim, um, and that really turned into arrogance. Yeah. And then you also see the genuineness and the authenticity 
that the tax collector had. Um, I, th- I think about pastors, and I think about the difficult job they have to yeah. contextualize the message of Jesus in a relevant, modern way. Sometimes it, at our church, we get uh, really lambasted for people say, and I'm using quotes here, water down the gospel, when in reality the gospel doesn't change. Our, our message has stayed the same through the beginning of our church to now it yeah. will continue that way. What does change, though, is culture and trying to find a way to use modern-day examples to really explain the gospel to a cultural audience. Sure. So yep. easier said than done. It's a very difficult job pastors have. Um, I think, though, the key for them when they do that should be humility and it should be authenticity. Man, I hate fake pastors. I don't know about you, <laughs> but when pastors feel like, you know what, I'm holy, so you should be holy, that is such a turnoff. Right. Um, what I want is somebody who's real. He's real. My, my favorite pastors and speakers are people who are willing to say, you know what, I got some junk that I'm having to deal with. Mm-hmm. Um, I've made mistakes, and you know what, because of that, grace abounds in my life, and it can in yours as well. Yeah, definitely. Um, one thing I did want to bring up before we moved on is you talked about the good people question. Um, and one of the books we had to read for my class on why God allows evil was called Ordinary Men. Okay. And it's about a unit in Nazi Germany um, for a bunch of soldiers that um, started out just regular dudes, um, just wanted to, quote, serve their country, had no sure. idea what was going to happen. Right. And you read their story. Now, the guy who wrote this had access to these documents that ex- that told stories of what happened. And so this is all history. Um, and he explains how they went from these ordinary guys that when they were first commanded to go kill innocent people, yep. w- men, women, children, Jewish people, um, that they were vomiting and they were disgusted and they were they couldn't even look huh. at them. So they were, but they didn't want to die. And so they did these awful things. And then through the through the progression of their unit and how these guys continued to do these things, at the end of um, their their time in this uh, unit, they were enjoying it. They loved it. Wow. it became a part of them. I mean, Elie Wiesel, who wrote Night about his time in the concentration camps and all these people that have survived, most of them will say, the one thing I learned is that anybody's capable of this. If it were me, it could be me on the other end doing the same things that they're doing, that we all inside of us have that evil, which crazy. And the tax collector (laughs) understood this. The Pharisee didn't. Good point. Well, let's move to Luke 18. We're going to look at 1 through 8. This is the parable of the persistent widow. Andy, do you want to read it for us? Yep. It says, one day Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they should always pray and never give up. There was a judge in a certain city, he said, who fe- neither feared God nor cared about people. A widow of that city came to him repeatedly saying, give me justice in this dispute with my enemy. The judge ignored her for a while, but finally he said to himself, I don't fear God or care about people, but this woman is driving me crazy. <laughs> I'm going to see that she gets justice because she is wearing me out with her constant requests. Then the Lord said, learn a lesson from this unjust judge. Even he rendered a just decision in the end. So don't you think God will surely give justice to his chosen people who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will grant justice to them quickly. But when the Son of Man returns, how many will he find on the earth who have faith? Very good. So it's interesting. Jesus does this. He picks extremes again. So he picks a judge, somebody who has a lot of control, Mm -hmm. a lot of power, a lot of wisdom. But he makes him unjust right. and evil, and he's right. corrupt, yep. which the people, I'm sure, could relate to. Sure. Uh, he also then picks a widow who, in this society and status, had no power, Right. probably was uneducated, uh, had no real means of getting justice on her own. So he right. picks someone who's very powerful but evil and someone who has no power but is seeking holiness and justice and righteousness. Jesus could have picked anybody, but these are the characters that he picks right. for this parable. And the point I think that Jesus is trying to make, I'm not trying to put words in his mouth here, is that when we go to God, God who is just and right and righteous, who does have all the power in the universe and sees perfectly, has all the wisdom, God holds all the cards. When we go to him, we should be persistent in our prayers, that we are like that widow who really has no power, no say in the matter. God is going to do what he's going to do. Right. But the principle here I think Jesus is trying to teach is that we should continue to bring our request to God to again and again and again. And because we know that God is holy and just and does love us, um, think about even more so how much he may answer our requests. If an unjust guy is willing to do it just to get this woman off her back, think about how much God who loves us yeah. will answer our requests. Yeah, and so uh, 
the thing we wanted you guys to discuss is what 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 is something or someone that you've prayed for constantly? Like you've done what this widow did, and it's persistent prayer. Luke, you want to start? You know, it, it's kind of funny. I I have um, you, usually men, not always. I have people all the time that want to be at staff on staff at Cedar Creek, and they will come to me and say, you know, like you know, what did you do? Well, what I did was I served my butt off for eight years. That's usually not the answer that people want to hear. <laughs> but I can remember many times praying, saying, God, I, I want to do full-time ministry. I want to do full-time ministry. I felt like he had prompted me to do that. I felt yeah. like it was his will. And the reality was at the time the church just didn't have the money or wasn't in the position to do so. So it was literally eight years yeah. before I wanted to become full-time staff, and I was. Um, I prayed for it and prayed for it and prayed for it. And it, it's kind of ironic it was almost when I gave up and said, you know what, this may never happen, or I may need to start looking for another church. Yeah. Uh, I went to seminary. I graduated seminary. And guess what? I still didn't get hired on full time. <laughs> so we were in a hiring freeze. Sorry, I became a janitor. I literally had to do whatever I could for extra income to support yeah. the family. I worked part time, but it wasn't until I said, okay, God, if this doesn't ever happen, that's okay, because I'm going to trust you, not what I want, but what you want. Um, then finally I was asked to come on full time. That's well, and some of that, I think too, just to hop in on your sure, story please. is I think sometimes it's not, you know, like it, it, you, you might not be ready. You right. know what I mean? God might be looking at you going, uh, cause I know the things that I, that I would pray for that I thought, man, I really wanted this yep. here. Yep. You look back five years from there and go, uh, oh boy. Can you imagine if right. I would have been in that situation yes. then? Yes. And, and the how, truth how was, that would have ruined me. Uh, think I about the relationship you might have had, and you go, oh man, yep. I know this is the one. And you're like, if you would have been married to that <laughs> right, one, you're yeah. like, oh no. It's like a little Seriously. Garth Brooks, some of God's oh, greatest gifts. Unanswered or, prayers. Unanswered prayers. It's a great song. They made a movie about it, weirdly enough. It's a great song, though. What was it called? Unanswered Prayers. Oh, and it tells the story of the song. What? I thought you were going to say Gone in 60 Seconds. <laughs> So okay, funny. let's bring it back here. Yeah. So, Andy, there are so many good parables yeah, a lot. and stories of miracles that we just did not have time to go into. Um, I would say, guys, if you have not experienced these for yourselves, please, please, please read about these in the Gospels. Um, through each of them, they point to Jesus' divinity, God's plan, the, the beauty of it, and just the mastery of Jesus' teachings. They've been literally debated for 2,000 years now yeah. and will continue to be. Uh, because Jesus was a masterful teacher and storyteller. Yeah, definitely. Well, like you said, go back and read. Uh, we were talking, talking about Luke earlier, so try and read through the, the Gospel of Luke. Interestingly enough, if you want to find parables, don't go to the Gospel of John because there are none in there. He didn't ah, include any parables. We'll talk more about what that a tricky guy. next episode. Um, if you want to connect with us, you can find us on Facebook, Luke Shortridge or Andy Rechtenwald. Um, you can also email us. We get tons of emails. We've answered 100% of them on the air at podcast at cedarcreek.tv. Good stuff. All right, Andy, well, it was great hanging out with you. Next time we are going to be talking about John plus the crucifixion and the resurrection. It's only the most important event, the, mm. the total sum of human history. No so, big deal. No big deal. We'll handle it. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a good one. Okay, see you guys. Have a good one. See you. All right, bye. Bye.